Greetings, Guardians. My name is Bife here. So, I'm definitely not the first one to discuss this topic in the lore community. That title goes to the wonderful Mylan Games, as best I know, and as a result, I wanted to go ahead and link his video on this very quickly down below. His takes on things, they're actually what prompted me to look into this topic in the first place, and I definitely think that his video is worth a watch. I'm going to go ahead and leave the link to that in the description, but yeah, for those of you who haven't seen the thumbnail and who are just listening through this, the topic for today is on throne worlds, and specifically we're going to pivot at the end to whether Eris can make one and should make one. I'll go over what a throne world is again, for those of you who are somewhat in the dark, and I'll be talking about the dynamics of them, and that'll be kind of important. I'll also be discussing some of what's been brought up this season on the matter, which is bound to be relevant especially for our new hive god of vengeance. So, what is a throne world? Newer players, or those who are less in tune with the lore, will probably know the term from the throne world of Savathun and that whole destination. The simplest summary is that a throne world is a pocket dimension that is created by incredibly powerful beings as a means of surviving death. Throne worlds are commonly attributed to the Hive Gods, such as Oryx, Crota, Zivu, and Savathun, given that they were the first to really make use of them, but they've been made by many more individuals than just the Hive. By channeling the sword logic, it's known that Toland the Shattered was able to create a lesser throne world, more akin to a spit of land in a vast sea, but nonetheless it seemed to at least have performed the function of preventing his death. This was discovered by Mara Sov as she was venturing through the Sea of Screams, from the realms that were within Oryx's control all the way back to her own throne world. The scorned Baron known as Hyrax the Mindbender used the action of killing Cade Six to fuel the creation of his own modest throne world, which we had to enter in order to kill him. Most fascinating of all is Queen Mara Sov, whose throne world was created by spectacularly different means than most thanks to the powers that forged it, including the Awoken Tekians and Riven, the last known Ahamkara. Up until she was taken by Oryx, her throne world was supposedly a place of balance as opposed to one that was shattery and shattered like it is today. So, throne worlds are more than just a hive concept, although the concept seems to have originated with them and the Worm Gods. Let's talk a little bit more about how they're made though, which is likely to be very important for the future. Back in the Books of Sorrow in Destiny 1, we get a lot of descriptions that point toward individual triumph and power as the major factors required to forge a throne world. The Crota's End Grimoire card states that Crota's throne world, which they refer to in that card as a netherworld, was created by his own will. The Books of Sorrow state that Oryx's throne world was manifested as a result of his might. The Books of Sorrow also state that the throne worlds of Oryx, Sivuarath, and Savathun were all created from the minds and worms of our lords, which in this instance I believe refers to the same three hive gods, Oryx, Savathun, and Sivuarath. Toland also states that the throne worlds are all connected in ascendant space, and that the void between them that links them all is known as the Sea of Screams, the great nothingness of the ascendant realm. If I'm not mistaken, the Season of the Lost adds a little bit more clarity to this, stating that this ascendant realm was in fact not always the shadowy expanse that we saw in the Season of the Lost, and that it has been influenced by the likes of the Hive and those who exert their will over it. So, principally, what we learn from all of that is that throne worlds for the Hive have traditionally manifested thanks to the power of the Hive Gods and the worm larvae that they ingested. Sword logic is something that can expand the throne world for the Hive and is something that helps them express their power, but it appears to be so only because the practice of this logic lends power to the Hive. In the Edge of Concurrence Glaive, we see that Savathun was able to return to her throne world after she had taken the light, but also it shows that after this point her throne world was a shell of itself without the sword logic, something that perhaps lapsed in her absence, which she then began to twist and change when she returned. Do remember that Savathun might have forgotten a few things, 
but the Hive, regardless of their allegiance to either Savathun and to the Light or Zivor Wrath and the Darkness, still worship the sword logic and therefore will continue to empower their throne worlds with it. The hollowing out of the throne world in this regard was perhaps a chance for Savathun to better change the throne world around her to suit her newfound powers, and it leads us to another kind of relevant tangent. Throne worlds are reflections of the powers that create them and, in some instances, the powers that have indwelled within them. To show you what I mean, let's take a look at three throne worlds, Crota's, Savathun's, and Marasov's. Crota's throne world is the easiest to understand and it's pretty straightforward as far as Hive throne worlds can get. The laws are aligned with the sword logic and its aesthetic matches that. It's only influenced by one individual and so the entire design is cohesive. It's set up as a castle-like complex with bridges and sword bearers, where Crota is meant to hold court at the apex of it all beneath the Oversoul throne, where his power is most complete. However, it's the aesthetics and the rules of this world that really display what's happening here as far as the dynamics of power are concerned. Everything in the architecture is quintessentially Hive, which makes sense given that according to their view of the sword logic, only the Hive should persist. The Hive have proven themselves strongest, after all, according to the logic of the sword and their own history. The laws of Crota's throne world place supreme authority on the logic of the sword, which makes even more sense for a hive, but the way this all manifests is actually quite literal. Ascendant hive swords have remarkable power in Crota's throne world, enough to literally dethrone Crota himself as a matter of fact. Keep all of that in mind and remember that this is Crota's kind of almost baseline test version of a throne world, something we can use as a sort of unchanging sample. Savathun's throne world, on the other hand, presents us with an example of what can happen when there are multiple influences on a throne world, because it's something that is caught in the midst of change. Savathun has taken half of the throne world and has been able to completely flip it on its head. The hive architecture remains, but in a far less oppressive hue. Savathun's clearly incorporated a lot more complete and resplendent architecture, which is a departure from typical hive design as is. All this is clearly influenced by Savathun's acquisition of the light. There's a problem though, because power over the throne world for Savathun seems incomplete. During the Witch Queen campaign, we get the hints that the Witnesses' forces and Savathun are running a bit of a turf war within the throne world, and that Savathun is being pushed back. This is hinted to by the Scorn's presence, but also by the presence of Rolk. As the area around the Miasma and the Disciples' Bog spreads out, so too does the influence of Darkness, the Witness, and the Pyramids. Here you can actually see Savathun's old architecture, not converted over to the light, but instead sinking and festering into the mud of the throne world, and thus becoming a lot less lucent and, clearly, a sign of her decaying power. Meanwhile, the gates into the Disciples' Bog stand as something utterly different. Hive Guardians have been forced to guard it so that the Lucent Hive forces have some vague idea and notion of control in this region, but the architecture of the pyramids stands for the most part as pretty straight, up until the point at which you get around the Cursed Pyramid, which was struck with light. This means that it has sunken into the bog, but a lot of the structures surrounding it still remain intact, and that shows who's really in power here. All of this is a reflection of the fact that Rolk is literally still there, as is the Sunken Pyramid, and Savathun, despite being a great influence in her own throne world, is contested by Rolk on equal ground. Even within his light-cursed pyramid, the influence the Disciple can exert is meaningful, and it means that the throne world is not cast in Savathun's single lucent hue. It is contested. Unlike Crota's, which we discussed earlier, where everything is cohesive, everything is all under one law and one aesthetic and clearly serves one master. This helps us to understand the nature of throne worlds a little better. The will of those that inhabit them is predominantly what seems to shape them. Guardians were able to use this fact to our advantage, and our understanding of the laws in Crota's throne world helped us to kill him. Equally, Rolk's will is enough to shape the throne world of Savathun somewhat, or at least to impede her from completely changing it to be in her image. 
This leads me to a point that I've made years ago and which I'm going to bring up again, which is that the lore seems to suggest the idea of throne worlds being influenced more by the force of will than by the force of physics. Paracausal beings seem to have tremendous advantages when it comes to the ability to shape throne worlds, and that's no surprise given that they have the powers of light and dark, which are able to shape the universe by breaking or bending its laws. It's not the first time I've coined this phrase, but I'll coin it again here. I believe that throne worlds are what I could refer to as psychomutable spaces. In other words, they are spaces that can be changed according to the actions of the mind or consciousness. Something that Savathun quietly confirmed with this line near the end of the Witch Queen campaign. You're back. What a surprise. Only joking. This throne world is indistinguishable from my own mind, Guardian. Every step taken, every bullet fired, every thought whispered. I keep and count them all. Remember that. Moving on to Marasov's throne world, it's another perfect example of how someone else can influence a throne world that doesn't belong to them, but in that instance the case is far more extreme. When Mara was taken by Oryx at the start of the Taken King campaign, he actually was able to walk into her throne world, leaving his Taken rot and decay wherever he stepped. This effect was so powerful that according to Eremis in the Eremite lore tab, it's actually permanent. We'll go ahead and read through that later in this video though. This is why when we visit Marasov's throne world in the Shattered Throne dungeon, it's veiled in darkness, and whilst the architecture is still clearly awoken in design, it's cracked and shattered. Marasov may have been the one to originally create it, alongside her awoken Techians and Riven of a Thousand Voices, but it's clearly been influenced and overtaken by the Taken King's influence. So, with all of that stuff about throne worlds explained, that takes us to the Eremite and the implications it has for the future of Eris Morn. The fusion rifle's got a lot of hype in game as is, but its lore is also noteworthy. So let's go ahead and read through that lore, which consists of a communication from Eris Morn to Queen Marasov of the Awoken. Take a listen to this. Retreat to the mind. My queen, Undoubtedly, you have read the reports. I make no apology for the ritual I have performed, or what I become under its effects. You too have done many things in your own life that revealed who you are. The Guardians see me unrestrained. I do not control my emotions when I enter the Oubliette and embrace my transformation. I warned you of this many years ago, when I was afraid of what I might do. But I am no longer afraid. The time for warnings has passed. We have the knowledge we need. Long ago, I warned you of the threat Oryx posed and the imminence of his arrival. I spoke of his sword logic and his throne world, of his insatiable worm and the power of his dreadnought. With this insight, you did something marvelous. Your throne world, your Eleusinia, is a testament to your will, to your Techian skill, and to Riven's delight. Sadly, its desecration is, to our knowledge, irreparable. I am certain it was once beautiful, but I believe it was also the sole exception in a process of creation that is uniquely Hive. If only the slaying of a powerful being was required, then every Guardian would be reveling in their own creation. Recall that it was only with Hive magic that the scorned Baron Hyrax, the Mindbender as he wished to be styled, created a throne through Cade Six's murder. So too did Crota affect his own throne in the same way. Of course, Oryx and Savathun's thrones are well known to us. A worm husk of bone, a lush garden of light. Others have seen brief and terrible glimpses of Zivor Wrath's throne. It gapes like a moor, following her wherever there is war. Theirs were inadvertent. Upon their first true deaths, they did not know what they had made. With their strength and the power of their worms, they created something dire and found themselves there upon their deaths. 
Imagine the Hive God's first glimpses of their realms. To retreat to one's throne is to retreat into the variances of one's mind. It is a stark confrontation. You were well prepared for yours. Such was the consequence of my warning. I could well imagine my surprise at the variances of my own. As my own emotions surprise me now. But imagining must be enough for me. Eris Morn the end of this passage makes me believe two things. First of all, it makes me believe that through Hive Magic, Eris Morn has been able to create her own throne world, and that through our tithes, it is growing substantially. I also believe that Eris is not intent on dying so that she might be resurrected within it at any point soon. Equally though, the words at the end of the paragraph do leave room for doubt. It could be that Eris using the phrase, imagining must be enough for me, represents the idea that she doesn't actually have a throne world, and that she therefore can't afford to die. It could be a representation of another more troubling possibility. Eris has sworn to forsake her transformations and this new hive form after the task at hand is complete. It's unconfirmable at this time, but perhaps Eris would need to fully transform into a hive in order to acquire a throne world, or at very least would need to fully accept the magics of the ritual in order to have it form, hence why she will have to be content only imagining it. The thing is, I imagine that this may well be a point of contention. I'm not the only one to speculate about Eris having to potentially die this season in a great showdown with Zivu Arath. I'm confident that if she does, she'll have a plan in place that will allow her to cheat death much like the Hive do. The only question that persists is this. At what cost? And does it involve a throne world? If it does, who knows what that means for us? Who knows what that means for Zivu Arath? Who knows what it means for our bargain with Imaru? Who knows what it means for poor Asa, who has also been tied into this ritual? We will, of course, discover in due time. But that's all from me for now. I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, go ahead and leave a like, and let me know your thoughts down below in the comments section. Do you think this is hinting at the idea that Eris already has a throne world, or do you think that this is hinting at the idea that she might need to acquire one in the future? I'm personally unsure with the way that this is written. It is certainly clear, though, that Eris has done a bunch of thinking about it, and is certainly sure that acquiring one is not outside the realm of possibilities for her. Whatever your thoughts on the matter are, leave them down below. If you want more updates on the story of Destiny and the season of The Witch, go ahead and hit subscribe and the bell next to subscribe to turn on those email notifications. But as per usual, know that your viewership, as always, is quite enough for me. And that in the meantime, my name has been, my name is Baif, Orodasia Arastra. I'll see you, Starside. <laughs>